Well, thank you for coming. I know it's a, a Saturday evening, and um, so I appreciate uh, having this opportunity uh, to be able to uh, share with you a little bit. Um, let me start by just saying a little bit about myself. Um, I realize that um, some people know who I am and some people don't, and um, I'm always surprised when I expect that people know who I am um, and I introduce myself and, and they, they kind of stare blankly at me. So, um, so it, I'm Michael Blair and I, I have the enormous uh, pleasure of serving you as the General Secretary of the United Church of Canada. I come to this role as uh, the first openly um, black person, person of color to serve in the role as General Secretary um, in almost 100 years of the life of the church. And that, that's uh, a kind of a significant um, piece, both for the church, but for me personally. It means that I um, get involved in places that some other General Secretaries would take for granted. Um, it's really important to me as a black man and as a gay black man uh, to um, show up in spaces and places where um, folks are alarmed that black folks still uh, feel that church is important in some segments and in particularly as we live in a time where the issues around racial identity and um, racism is, is rampant and folks are um, wanting to say that um, Christianity has been a tool of the colonial powers to, to rob uh, those of us who experience um, the transatlantic slave. It's important to uh, show up in places and to say that uh, as a black person, um, I'm still committed to church. Church has meant something to me and that um, I can be, and you can be too, uh, leader in, in, um, in church. So it's, it's important uh, for me uh, to do that as time, from time to time because that's part of. Also in the context of um, places, and I still encounter that and I, encounter it mostly, I encounter it here, but I also encounter it uh, as I travel, that there are um, people who need to know that it's, you can be Christian and gay, and that that's not a contradiction. So, so th those parts of my identity are, are critical uh, for me, um, for who I am and how I show up in the world. I'm originally from Jamaica, <clears throat> and I still identify myself as a Jamaican, even though I've lived longer in Canada than I have lived in Jamaica. So I've, um, this July was 46 years since I've been here in Canada. So um, in reality, I'm more a Canadian than I am a Jamaican, but I'm not prepared to let go of my Jamaican identity. I consider myself a bit of a denominational mongrel. Um, and I say that because I was um, raised in the um, Anglican church. Uh, the church that I grew up in, in in Kingston was, my mother was one of the founding members of that congregation. Uh, grew up having bishops and nuns and priests um, all the time uh, at home, so became very familiar with, with church in that way. <clears throat> Went to a Baptist high school, and in Jamaica, uh, most of the schools are run by churches, at least when I was growing up. Most of the schools were church-run schools, so I was influenced by the Baptists in my high school. Um, towards the end of my high school, I was quite uh, active in the Pentecostal church. And so in some ways, some of my formation has happened within the context of the Pentecostal tradition. I came to Canada and um, 
became part of the Baptist Church, was ordained as a Baptist minister, uh, served for almost 25 years in the Baptist Church um, before um, transitioning into the United Church. So it's a little bit about me. I've worked in the general counsel office since 2008. I started in that role, uh, started in general counsel in 2008 as the executive minister for ethnic ministries. Uh, a couple years later, when my colleague in French ministry retired, I was asked to take on responsibility for ministries in French as well, in addition to um, ethnic ministries. And then when my colleague Harry Soren retired, from the work he was doing with um, congregations um, and the educational system, I was asked to take that on as well. And then when my colleague Omega Bula, who was responsible for the global and ecumenical work of the church retired, I was asked to take that on as well. So becoming general secretary feels like um, the, the easiest of all, of all this stuff. So <clears throat> I come to the role having been around the church for a while, and although not a cradled United Church person, and though I came to the United Church uh, as an adult, I'm very conscious of the ability to kind of see the church as an outsider, but also see the church as an insider, as someone who is committed to the well-being and the life of the church. I have uh, two sons. Um, my, uh, one is 30 and one is 25, and uh, they forget that um, they, I, I remind them every day that they are my um, retirement plan, so they better uh, get themselves uh, worked out. Um, and I, I am partnered. Um, my partner is Don, uh, who's uh, from the Philippines. So that's a little bit about me. What I'd like to do is kind of just uh, share some things with you, and hopefully uh, we'll have some time for Q&A and, and questions, because I would like to, to hear from you as well as we think about that. And, and what I want to reflect with you on is the, the, the topic of for such a time as this. At the start of the pandemic, the challenge was whether or not the pandemic was a disruption or an interruption. For the most part, we started out thinking that uh, the pandemic was an interruption we would get back. I still remember when we closed the office at the General Council that in two weeks we would be back. Uh, we're not back yet. <laughs> um, but we all thought it was just a momentary blip in time. But what has happened, I think, is that it's become clear that the pandemic was not an interruption but it was a disruption. It's disrupted our understanding of what it means to be community. It disrupted what our understanding of, of health. It's disrupted our understanding of church. Um, it's really has been an incredible disruption in our, in our life, in our society, um, in our ability to connect. It was a disruption in the way in which we even grieved. My partner's mother died um, in the, during the pandemic <clears throat> in the Philippines, and because of the pandemic, the Philippines would not allow any burial. Um, cremation was the only way um, to go. And Canadians were not allowed to enter the Philippines. So for two years, he was not able to um, be with his siblings uh, to do any way, any kind of celebration of life for his mother. And the, the, the unresolved grief of that time has just been unbelievable. And you, many of you know that as you've lost loved ones over this period of time. And the, uh, you know, there was this mad rush as things opened to do celebrations of life. And you kind of wonder what, what does that do to us in terms of our ability to grieve and to celebrate lives. 
So the question <coughs> that faces us is a question of discerning the future of the church in the context of a disruptive season. I, that, that's a question that I wake up to daily and I go to bed to uh, nightly. How do we imagine what church could be like in the context of this significant disruption that, we, that has happened for us? And so we've been, within the general counsel office, uh, within those of us who share in leadership in the life of the church, we've been wrestling with this notion from the book of Esther for such a time as this. What does it mean for us to be church and to offer leadership in the life of the church for such a time as this? And let me just talk to you a little bit about some of the challenges that this time we face. The first significant challenge we face is, this, is that there's a narrative of decline that has dominated our imagination as the United Church of Canada. We think only about decline. And, and it's so entrenched in our, in our imagination. And, and there is reason for that. We know um, we close a congregation, one congregation a week. That's outright closure or amalgamation or something. But we lose one congregation a week. And when you think about that, you kind of have to ask yourself then, so what does that mean? Uh, what is our future is like? Can you start to multiply 52 congregations a year times how many years times uh, how many congregations we have and you kind of say, you know, we're going to close the, the doors in the, in the not too distant future. Finances is a huge struggle for many of our communities of faith. Buildings are another challenge for us. Attendance is down. Can you imagine that um, just before the pandemic, um, the average attendance across the country was 115,000 people? 115,000. The United Church, which prides itself as being the largest Protestant denomination in Canada, only has a membership of under 500,000. Right? Consider that in a country that's 34 plus million people, although the census tells us that uh, 2.4 million people in Canada self-identify as, as United Church, in reality, we are less than 500,000 who are members of the United Church. So when you think about those kinds of numbers, you begin to, to think, I mean, it's, whoops, sorry. It's, it's hard not to think about decline. And we are in a time where many of us are tired of Zoom. We, <laughs> that started quite early. Another, um, part of as we read the signs uh, is the challenge of ministry. We are in a new time. Frankly, I take my hat off to all of you who serve in pastoral leadership in this particular time. I have no idea how you do it. You were never trained <laughs> for, for this. None of us were trained for this. And it's a challenge um, to think about this kind of new environment in which we find ourselves and, and how we do that. Do you know that the average age of a member of the United Church of Canada is 75? Let that sink in, well, um, for us. We also recognize that we have an aging demographic, not only in terms of our membership, but also in terms of uh, folks who are coming into ministry are coming in later in life. Uh, if you remember, and this was, 
this was part of the challenge for us as a church is that we make decisions or we ease ourselves into situations and we never think about the consequences of it. So when we encourage people at 18 and 20 to go get life experience before they come back for, <laughs> for preparation for ministry leadership, we fully expected that they would come back at 24 or 25, right? We just wanted them to get a year or so of life before they come back. Well, they're not coming back until they're 50 or 55, right? We, in the last uh, five years, we have ordained about three people who are over 70, right? But here's the other thing. So folks who come in, by the time they study um, and, and are ord ordained, they only serve window. I, I've known people who were ordained, served for three years, and then retired, right? All that puts pressure on, that puts pressure on our, um, our pension, right? So there's not enough, there's not enough of us old enough um, to continue to contribute to the pension plan. So pension plan is in good shape now, but it's, it's, it's a stress because we have more people who will be retiring than more people who are coming into the life of the church. About eight years ago, no, probably, yeah, probably about 10 to eight years ago, we had more ministry personnel who were over 100 than we had under 35. For such a time as this. <laughs> Here's another, here's another stat that just blew me out of the water um, two weeks ago when I heard it. We currently have 348 vacancies in the United Church across the country, right? There are 348 vacancies. Of those 348, only 60 are full-time positions. you begin to see some of the challenge. Most of the other positions are part-time in all kinds of configuration. We have areas of the country where we are changing the language now to talk about lay-led congregations as a way of not contributing to this notion that if you don't, somehow if you don't have an ordered leader, you're a failure. So we're switched in, switching the language to lay led congregations. Um, in Northern Ontario, I think in the old Manitou Conference um, in Northern Ontario, I think there are only two ordered uh, ministry uh, leaders in that part of the, the country for such a time as this. We also have um, economic realities challenge of, uh, we sold off our manses, and now it's coming back to bite us. Uh, for instance, in Toronto and in Vancouver, um, we can't get ministry leadership in those areas because people can't afford to live there. Um, so that's, that's a challenge for us. Um, in that um, as ministry leadership are retiring and folks can't afford, and I, I know Toronto and Vancouver, but I, I think it's true for other parts of the country, it's becoming a challenge um, with the economic realities. Between 2020 and 2021, congregational givens declined by 12.4%. Congregational revenues declined by 20%. In a normal time, 
uh, the decline in revenue from congregation would be between three and four percent. This one surprised me, but I understand with the pandemic and not being able to do suppers and things. UCW um, um, fundraising was down 66.4 percent. And that's a canary in the coal mine uh, when you begin to see that. So, this is, this is part of the reality, I think, um, that is our life together. And I think part of the challenge for us as we think about for such a time as this is how we stop putting our heads in the sand and not facing the reality of where we are today. And um, part of, I think part of the leadership of our life together is a leadership which is saying we need to begin to speak truthfully about where we are if we're going to imagine what a future, our future is going to be. And if we choose not to be real about what we're experiencing now, we're, going to be in, we're just going to be in trouble. Just a couple of other things, as you know. Reconciliation, the work with the indigenous communities, and particularly the graves, and the impact of the graves, not just only on indigenous communities, but the fact that there are people who would have identified themselves as spiritual but not religious. The reality of the graves, we have lost those people because they can't imagine being part of an institution that contributed to such genocide, right? So we have that part <laughs> of, of, of the issues around reconciliation and graves to deal with, and we have the larger work of building reconciliation with the indigenous communities of this land and within our church. Property has become an albatross around most of our communities' necks. Congregationalism is rearing its head, and many of our congregations are uh, rediscovering the, congreg the congregationalist energy of our united system. Denominational identity is a challenge. How do we maintain um, um, our identity as the United Church of Canada and not the untied Church of Canada? We're in the midst of climate emergency. We're also in the midst of the pandemic realities and the issue of technology. And I hear it all the time that there is a resistance to um, technology. But the reality, I think, is that hybrid is here to stay. It's not going to go away. And hybrid has all kinds of issues around uh, communities and that kind of stuff. The challenge for us, I think, is this. We need to do some theological work on what it means to be community in this time where technology is, is prevalent. There's a Zoom fatigue. It really is. And I must confess that there's a part of me that enjoys um, the accessibility. And I, if I can confess, on Sunday mornings, I have my cell phone, my ear thing in. I'm in worship with my, the community of faith that I attend, but I'm out getting my walk in. <laughs> All right? and, and I recognize that um, worship in some ways, and it's a personal struggle, worship in some ways has become um, a, a commodity because it gives me the access to do that. And I'm one of those people, if I don't, if I don't attend when it's actually happening, finding the time to listen to it later it ain't going to happen. Right? Uh, but it's become a commodity because I can listen 
and do my walk. I stop in our, in the congregation I attend to, we have a 20 minute, uh, not 20 minute, a, a 60 second meet and greet. They put us into small group and we can meet and greet. So at that point I stop so I can greet Greet, greet folks in the congregation, but then I'm on to my walk. But we've got to do some thinking about what that, because it's here to stay, and we have to challenge ourselves. And every time I do it, and I know it's just, my week is crazy, and on a Sunday morning, when I can go for my walk, I'm going to opt for my walk and try and multitask. But, so we need to think about that. And of course, we know we live in a time where kind of um, right-wing ideology is becoming more and more prevalent uh, across. So those are some signs of the times. Those are some of the places where uh, we are. And so what does it mean to be church and to offer leadership um, in such a time as this? And part of it is the need to disrupt the narratives of decline that is so much part of our, our imagination. So I, I want to just offer three things quickly and then uh, leave, it, leave some time for us to have some conversation together. In 2006, at the 39th uh, General Council, at the end of the council, there was uh, a call to the church from the church. And one of, the, one of the items, it starts out by asking us, what does God have for the United Church at the start of its third generation? And that's a question that is, has that is been, I've been pondering it. And so it starts out by asking that question that, that we need to discern what it is that God is calling us as the United Church of Canada uh, to be and do in this particular time. And then it ends with a prayer, and the last line of the prayer says, God, lead us into your future rooted in the richness of our past. So for such a time as this, I think we're invited again into a time of discernment, but part of that discernment comes from understanding our past, the richness of our past. We need to rediscover again the stories of who we are as the United Church of Canada. And so part of that discernment begins with a conversation about union. Right? Now, there's a shadow side to our union. I don't know if you realize that. That the union talks, part of, the, part of our union talks was because we were deathly afraid that the Catholics were going to take over this country. And we needed a Protestant bulwark to protect ourselves from those Catholics. Right? That's a, that's a shadow side of our union. So let's put that aside a little bit. <laughs> but, but let's not forget that there is a shadow side of it. And, and, but what drove our union was a commitment, was a commitment to be able to find ways to share the gospel that, as we understood it across this vast country again. And I think for such a time as this, we are called to rediscover a confidence in the gospel. That's part of our history. And we're called to rediscover it. Friends, I think we have become afraid to name ourselves as followers of Jesus. I want to declare myself as unapologetically Christian. I'm not going to apologize 
for my faith and my understanding of the incredible ways in which God works transformation in my life and the life of others through the ministry of Jesus Christ. I think it's a time where, and I know there are all kinds of theological nuances, but friends, if we don't rediscover a confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have no future. It's part of our history. It's part of the the strength of our history. I think the second thing is around this discernment about the richness of our past is that we have to rediscover it and how to takers. We've forgotten how to be risk takers. We play it safe in this church. Other people think we're, <laughs> think we're so, so radical. The reality is that we're not risk takers. And we need to discover again what it means to take risk what it means to make some hard decisions because we know that those decisions will have impact on the lives of people. And the third thing I would say, and there's much more I'd say around this piece of discernment. Is this, we need to understand again, and those of you will be here tomorrow, I'll say a little bit more than this. Friends, we need to discover again that the church exists not for the sake of itself, but for the sake of the world. The church exists not for the sake of itself, but for the sake of the world. And when we play it safe, it's because we're protecting ourselves when we risk is because we understand that the world needs to know that God has not abandoned the world and that God so loved the world and continues to love the world. So I think in, for such a time as this, that's part of our, the call, call to discernment. A second thing is to embody hope. We live in a time where hope is lost. The black African descendant anthem has a line in it, when hope unborn, when it felt like hope unborn had died. And friends, we are called to be hope-filled, not just hopeful people who will speak of possibilities and newness and opportunities. We need to embody hope as a people of God. And that means we've gotta be, we gotta be in relationship We gotta be in relationship with people outside the bricks and mortar of our building. I'll tell you a story and then one other point and then I'll let you talk to me. A congregation that I'm familiar with in, in Toronto um, and, and um, a friend of mine is, who is not churched but he's the caretaker of the building. And the um, congregation was celebrating its 70th anniversary. And um, Rob Oliphant, uh, you may know that name, Rob Oliphant, who is a United Church minister, but he's a poly- he's, uh, MP in, in uh, Ottawa. Um, so they were inviting Rob to come they were having a wine and cheese event, and they were inviting Rob to come and speak. Right? So during the week, my friend kept all the people who rented space in the building, he kept saying to them, so are you coming on Saturday? Are you coming on Saturday? And they were like, 
what's happened on Saturday. We haven't been invited. Like, this is your 70th anniversary. You're not having somebody preach at people. It's a wine and cheese event for Pete's sake. And you have a politician coming. <laughs> what a perfect opportunity to invite the people who use the space in the building to say, we're celebrating our birthday. You know, we have a politician coming. Come join us for wine and cheese. And no, they just have it among themselves, right? <laughs> we got to build relationship with, with, with people outside. I was at a, a, a visitation last night, yesterday, of a woman who uh, died at 111. One of the, I think she's the second oldest person in Canada by a few months. And um, her MP, or MPP was at the visitation, somebody I'd known. And so we got chatting. And as I was listening to her, I thought, she doesn't know that there are church people and churches who would gladly um, work on some of the projects that she wants to work with, right? And I thought, just reminded her that, you know, give me a shout, I'll connect you with some of our churches, right? But she doesn't know because the churches in our neighbor, in, the, in her writing, none of them have gone and met her and talked to her and understand what's going on, right? So if you don't engage, <laughs> right, the cities are making plans that you need to be aware of. So we need to embody hope, and part of, part of that embodying of hope is about how we build relationship, how we speak, how we endeavor. And the final thing for such a time as this for us is this. We've got to lead from the future. So we've got to put ourselves where we want to be and lead from that place. So, um, we have now um, uh, a new uh, call and vision for the United Church of Canada. We're inviting congregations to consider this call of um, deep spirituality, bold discipleship, and daring justice. We are, um, have identified five strategic objectives that is going to frame the way in which we engage in ministry over the next three years. We've identified that we have to do, we have to reimagine the formation of leadership in the life of this church. Critical. Our leaders who currently serve and will serve in the future are critical to whatever future we have, and we need to invest in them. We need to take seriously that we are in a climate emergency. We can't pretend that somehow um, this is just an, the climate thing is just an interruption. It's an emergency and it requires us to do some things. So uh, we've, um, General Council has approved a uh, reduction of our carbon, uh, carbon impact by 80% by 2030. We've already started to invest in Faithful Footprints, which is a program that works with congregations around retooling their buildings. Um, we are working with UPRC, or Kindred Works, to help congregations reimagine what they may do with their building. We are looking at what we call the common good. And one of the things we've identified in that, which just got rolled out this Tuesday, is a new insurance company that we will begin to invite congregations to transfer, transfer their insurance. And we hope, I think there's an initial 30% reduction in, in cost because we 
we recognize that. But those are some of the, the things about common good that we're trying to, what can we do together to make uh, our, our life work? Um, <clears throat> we are reimagining our justice work and we've identified three key things that we will work on because they're critical when we lead from the future. Uh, reconciliation with the indigenous communities is one. Racial justice is the second one. And the third one is a global LBGTQ um, solidarity work. Friends, on that side, you know, we celebrate, well, we're living into 1988, but we've made great strides and we're in a country that is supportive of folks who are LBGTQ. And yet there are places around this globe that need our voices and our support, individual that needs us. And somehow this is why we gotta get out of our heads that somehow it's all about us. The church exists for the sake of the world and that. The final thing we're doing, <laughs> the, the fifth uh, objective is what we're calling um, um, strengthening the invitation. And here's where we're going to try and disrupt the narrative of decline. We are anticipating that in the next three years, we're going to invest in a hundred new communities of faith. They ain't going to look like what we have now. And we're going to have to find some significant dollars to make that happen. But if we're not talking about growth, we're just going to bury, bury ourselves. And so we want to start 100 new, new communities of faith. We want to invest in congregations um, uh, who exist now, who need some support and help in re retooling so that they can be sustainable and viable. And we want to find a space where we will be bold in our advocacy um, and we will speak to the world that there is a church in Canada who believes that God still loves this place for such a time as this. Let me stop there. It took longer. I get excited about this stuff. Um, and, and hear from you. Uh, reflections, questions, um, you can talk at me. I will bite. <laughs> Critique. Okay. In terms of the objectives, leadership, climate, justice, strength initiative, and common good. Not really, because in some ways we're trying not to be prescriptive. So as we um, gather, so yeah. So on one hand, we're not being prescriptive, but here's the other, here's one, a number of, we think some of those communities of faith are only gonna exist online. We're experiment. there are two, two uh, uh, communities of faith now that only that started during the pandemic that only uh, exist online. So that's one of our imaginings that some of these would be online, uh, online only communities. Some of them we, given our um, our Methodist heritage, we have a lot of. Methodist folks who are immigrating into the country. A number of them are um, forming Methodist church because they, they don't see us as Methodists. 
And so we're looking at how we may partner with some of those communities to um, have some mutual benefit. So some, we're anticipating that some of those 100 congregations will be migrant church communities. So for instance, we um, currently have a relationship with uh, Ghanaian Methodist congregation, but there, we know that there are 10 Ghanaian Methodist congregations across Canada. And so we are in conversation with the leadership of the, the Ghanaian Methodists in Ghana about what relationship could look like and how we may be able to embrace them. We have about six Zimbabwean United Methodist congregations and both the United Methodists in the States and the um, presiding bishop of the Methodist Church in the United Methodist Church in Zimbabwe want to be in conversation with us about that. Uh, there are quite a number of Filipino Methodists, and again, the United Methodists in the States and a couple of the Filipino, um, Filipino bishops are starting some conversation. So some of them will, will be um, migrant communities, first and second generation. So we have that kind of idea. The rest is what it will take different forms. We have some manual issues that we're gonna have to deal with on this, but um, hopefully we can experiment and bring some manual changes to the next general council uh, that will free some of these experiments to take life. So one of the things we'll, we're looking at is in Pacific Mountain region, uh, there is a program called Leader Shift. And what the Pacific Mountain region and uh, BC Conference prior to that did was to say, leaders are a critical part of the life of the church and we need to invest in them. So there were opportunities for uh, cohorts uh, to be together to kind of wrestle with particular issues that they were they were facing um, You know, there were some expectations about uh, Con Ed um, So I think those are some of the things we're looking at we recognize One of the things we're clear about that is not we're just not talking about folks who are in the ordered stream we're talking about everybody so we're looking at the ministry of the whole people of God. I think we, we are, um, so again, this notion of lay-led communities of faith, we are looking at how do we strengthen and support uh, lay folks who are given leadership to communities of faith, as the reality is um, there may not be ever in some of those places um, ordain leadership for a whole host of reasons, some of which I, I outlined tonight. So I think we're, we're kind of looking at the whole system. I think we're having some conversations. We will have some conversations with the theological schools. We're also wondering, and this is just a wondering, so don't, don't leave and say, the general secretary said, uh, general secretary hasn't said, um, <laughs> but we're wondering about, do we need to um, reimagine formation for, for ministry leadership in a whole different ways? You come in at 55, you have to spend three or four years at seminary, two more years doing your supervised ministry education. And so seven years, five, you know, six or seven years is tied up 
by the time you hit, it's, it's problematic, right? So is there some ways in which we can um, reimagine how we do formation? Um, I think our seminaries are critical um, on a whole number of fronts, but I think we have left it up to the seminaries to do um, ministry formation, and the seminaries can't do that. We, we, it's, it's, been, it's been like somebody who tries the same thing over and over, expecting a different result, and I think we've got to have some hard conversation about are there some other ways in which we can work at the formation uh, of, of, of leadership. We are discovering that um, there are a number of ministers who are engaged in bivocational ministry. And we need to think about that. If you're in bivocational ministry, you don't spend the time that you are in the congregation in the pulpit. We've got to imagine ways in which, um, as a bivocational leader, you're, and it's part of our history, right? When I first came into this church, there was this clear understanding that part of the role of ministry leadership was the nurturing of leaders in the life of the church, right? Somewhere, somewhere along the line, I think we've forgotten some of that and we've stopped investing in that possibility. And part of the strength of our past is to kind of rediscover some. So in some ways, some of it is gonna feel like same old, same old. And it, but it's, we, we're a lot more intentional about what it is that we want to accomplish on the, on the back end. So it, we're, we're building on stuff that we used to do that for whatever reasons we, we let it go or we didn't, we didn't totally believe in it and energize it. So. <laughs> so, a couple of things. Uh, we, have, we have some exceptional people in the life of this church. And, uh, you know, part of my commitment is to find ways to make sure they feel supported and not, um, and not undermined, and that's easy to do. So I think the, the people that are part of the church the second thing which, which, which fills me with hope is last year when we, when we um, introduced the call, at that point in time we used the language of mission, of, of deep spirituality, uh, bold discipleship and daring justice. It, it took off and every place I go, and I've been, or been out and about in the church, uh, for a bit, it's coming at me, and I hear it. Shortly after I became uh, general secretary, I was, between the time it was announced that I was going to be the general secretary, and I started the role, I was invited by Emmanuel College to um, um, be the, lecture, the lecturer for one of their lecture series. And I said yes, not knowing <laughs> why. You know, it's one of these things where you, you say yes and then it, it becomes real and you kind of think, dear Jesus, why did I ever say yes? Um, but my, my topic uh, for that was becoming the beloved community. And I drew on, on um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, emphasis on, on the beloved community. What, is, what has filled me with hope is to hear that language starting to, um, I hear it all over the church now, this notion of, of being the beloved community, and, and that gives me hope. But the, the thing that gives me hope is this, and I believe it to the core of my being, 
and it's one of the reasons why um, I chose not to retire. <laughs> I, I was that age. I could have retired. Um, part of the reason I chose not to retire and, and um, applied uh, for this position is that I, I believe to the core of my being that God is not finished with this church yet. I think we have so much potential. And when I travel overseas, here's what happens. When I travel overseas and I say I'm from the United Church of Canada, and people start to tell me the story of what this church has meant for them, I have two things. Two things happen to me an enormous pride, right? And folks, our, our commitments and some of the folks who have served this church on the global side save lives. We make a difference in the life of people. So there's a part of me that just filled with pride, and there's a part of me that says, Man, I would love to know that church you're talking about. <laughs> it's not my experience. <laughs> but but that, that just, that we make a difference in the life of people. Um, our stories, which they know better than we do, make a difference in their life. And that gives me hope. But fundamentally, I honestly believe God has not finished. The final chapter hasn't been written for us as the United Church of Canada. There is just so much more that God wants to do in and through us. And there are people in this society and around the globe is longing for us. Uh, you know, the scripture talks about this kind of creation longing and growing for the revelation of the children of God. And, I, and I, I just think that if only we could rediscover the richness of our past and let that go, we can make a big difference. Sorry, I talked too much. <laughs> go ahead. I'll keep working so that you can draw yours. <laughs> Thank you.
So it's that time. Yeah. taping is it okay to put it on our YouTube channel uh, just want to ask permission of everybody to uh, I mean we live stream we weren't live streaming this but we were taping it uh, some of the actions may be uh, uh, on the screen but do we have permission to put it up on our YouTube channel uh, uh, for from everyone